Sorry? Well, well, you may not be able to demolish it because of heritage listings, all those sorts of things. All right. So, change of title could be something. Um, so do I got that one? All right. Thirty-seven. Host family. Oops, there's, there's no T in it. Host family. Um, so Japanese students, etc., or something like that, that want to stay and live in your property, you could actually do that. Um, Thirty-eight. Oh, um, a rental commission. So, as in the form of a management fee. Do some people do something like an on-site management? Yes or no? Right? Now, it doesn't have to quite be that way. I've known some people who own the whole building. They find someone in that property and say, you collect the, the rents for me and I'll just pay you um, a, a split of what the rent is, you know, a commission. All right? It doesn't have to be a full-blown on-site manager in the formal sense. But I'll put that one up. So that's management rights. That's the next level up. And often... You'll, you find this a lot more in Queensland than you do anywhere else. The developer will actually have a property that they sell, but they'll make it a little bit bigger and they'll have an office area of it and they'll sell it as the property. Then they'll sell the management rights for a couple of hundred thousand dollars on top. Does that make sense? And often the people in that building may not even be absolutely limited to rent via that person. Sometimes you get external real estate agents. Sometimes you get people that live there that won't pay any rent anyway but they still sell these management rights. It happens a lot more in Queensland than it does anywhere else. Um, okay. 40. Set up. 40. Set up a body corporate. Now, um, you could do this as a JV. Like, how do you earn money off this? Let's say, for instance, you as a group, as a syndicate, as a buyer's group, take out a building, right? Do you necessarily want to have the overhead of managing the body corporate, yes or no? Is that a hassle? Do you need specialised knowledge? Of course you do. So, one of, my, one of my friends, this is what he does, is as a developer, he then does a joint venture with a body corporate group. He sets up the body corporate through them as a joint venture, and he gets commission off that forever, is that a smart thing to do, yes or no? They do all the management. He does a profit split with them. He doesn't get a lot of profit, but it's still better than no profit. Would you agree with that? Okay. So, 41. Okay. Um, refinance regularly. Refinance regularly to get better deals. 42. Um, consolidate, consolidate with neighbours for a DA. Now, if a developer, a developer not even be looking in your street, but imagine this, if you got together with maybe two, three or four of your neighbours, together is your property as a, as a group worth more than one by itself, yes or no? So a developer may not have even been looking in your area, but if you can actually negotiate with neighbours, and I don't know some people who do this, they find older houses, they just rent them out, and they land bank, and they sit and wait. And they start a conversation with their neighbours to either buy them out or to work with them as a syndicate, so that what they then do is while they're sitting and holding that, they may even DA the site and then find developers and say, look, this is ready to go. We have four blocks, bang, that will sold in one line, even though they're separate vendors, and it's already D8. All you've now got to do is come in and build it, right? There are real estate agents that would just jump all over that because they already have developers waiting that they're actually trying to find deals for. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, where are we up to? It's 42. Consolidate with your name. Okay. Um, 43, roof area, GSM towers. One of the developments that I looked at at Canterbury Road um, here in Sydney with uh, a syndicate, we were looking at taking out the whole building. Um, it was actually next to a park and a little bit sort of high up, so it wasn't crowded. And we actually started discussions with um, 
3 was about to launch then. Why? Because they needed to put new radio towers and it was a central location in the area. It was next to a main road um, and it was because it was on a hill, it had really good coverage of everything around it. So we were going to sell some of the rights to the roof space for them to install a GSM tower. Okay. What else could you do? Well, 44. Um, roof area. Electricity. Back to the grid. Some of you may not know, but um, electricity is actually deregulated um, in New South Wales. I'm pretty sure it is for the rest of the country as well. But I've only done my research on New South Wales. What you can actually do is you put a second meter in, right, and you have the right to actually sell electricity back onto the grid. Which means that if you actually put solar collectors on your roof, you could sell that back to the grid. Now, um, there's a, a company... Um, in the US and what they specifically do is they target large um, manufacturers and shops which have very large scale roof spaces and what they do is say we will fund because they can get the funding in the US for this but the funding hasn't been set up in Australia for this we will put all the solar panels in you agree to buy the electricity from us right now think about this from the business's point of view it's a roof space they wouldn't have used they have now guaranteed the cost of the electricity for the next 10 years. Because what's most electricity generated off? Coal and oil. What do you think they're going to do over the next 10 years? Go up a little bit or go up a lot? A lot. So the companies where they put them in are happy to accept this because they guarantee their electricity price for the next 10 years. Plus, they know they're doing something good and they can market to that as well. Does that, that, is, that all make sense? Now, those companies, all they do is they now have a customer they sell the electricity back to. They've got a meter that tells them how much they're using. They have top-up through the normal grid. And the banks will see that as, as that item is depreciable over 10 years. It more than pays for itself, so they're willing to lend all the money on that. So it doesn't cost these companies anything. But you can do that on a smaller scale and get exclusive roof access, put those up there, sell power to the grid, and even give the body corporate a split of the profits. Um, Cover that one. All right, 45. Become or set up a concierge service. Concierge. This is particularly good in um, busy apartments. Could you sell, could you set up the building, 46, as timeshare? Right. Some buildings, um, there's a group up on the central coast of um, New South Wales, they couldn't sell all their buildings. They couldn't sell their apartments fast enough. So they had to come up with some other strategies, otherwise their banks would have had a bit of an issue with them. And what they did was they sold it to an unlisted property trust. So an, an unlisted property trust. What they did was they generated a prospectus, created a unit trust that was a public offer document, Obviously, when it was, sorry, it wasn't a prospectus, it was PDS, which is the new word for it. Um, and they then raised enough capital to buy from themselves, literally, their own properties they couldn't sell, and then created an unlisted property trust that actually owned those properties. People could just buy shares in, or units in that unlisted property trust, and it just bought the properties and owned and managed them. All right, 48. Okay, advertise them as serviced apartments. Meriton, uh, a lot of their apartments, what they do is they advertise them as, um, rather than just a normal apartment, as um, serviced so that they actually get a much higher cash flow from them. Um, you might get the equivalent of one week's rent in one night. Okay, public... Hotspot. So you could actually set up a public hotspot hot and you can have pop-ups with advertising. Pop-ups with advertising. Right. The Australian newspaper is actually sponsoring the free public hotspots in Qantas lounges because it takes them to their web page first. So could you find someone who's willing to pay for it install the infrastructure in your building or um, your common areas 
that gives free Wi-Fi access to people, but it just goes to a, um, a starting page of a sponsor. Okay, um, 50 sell-off water leases. There are some properties, particularly those um, in the farming communities, they have what are called water leases that have been granted to them. They're valuable. Um, there are other sorts of properties that have um, like thing, things like oyster leases. Same sort of thing. 52. Sell off pokies licences. There's a guy... Um, does anyone... If you're ever in Sydney, if you drive straight down Victoria Road and before it hits the Crescent... Right, and you turn left, and you go over the um, the main bridge into Sydney, which is the um, Anzac Bridge. There's a big pub on the left hand side, and it's got massive billboards on it. Has anyone ever seen that? It doesn't operate as a pub anymore. Just just as you come through Roselle, and you're just about to hit the overpasses that go to the bridge. Does anyone know that big pub? Anyone know it? Massive pub. A guy owns it. He's a bachelor. He has a great time because he's closed off the front entrance. He comes in by the back entrance there. He set it up the ultimate bachelor pad with big pool tables and everything he wants. But you see, what he did was he looked at the whole asset and said, well, how many turns can I get off this? How do I split off each of the turns? He sold off the pokies licenses to someone else, to the highest bidder. Um, as an example, um, what they call Penrith Leagues Club, they actually buy a lot of smaller clubs which have got pokies licences, right, for the sake of those pokies licences and then redistribute those pokies licences, some of them or in some cases all of them, back to their head office, right? Um, what he also did was he put up massive lots of advertising to get another return off that same asset. So 53 um, billboards. Now, can you do this on a smaller level? I've seen some um, properties on corner blocks that actually have signage on the fence or a big sign in the front yard that says, you know, Westfield this way or something like that. I've even seen developments that they've actually gone to a bit of trouble. And I'll just draw a diagram of this. If this is the front view, um, it's sort of like you've got bricks sort of sticking out and then it, it sort of dips back a little bit and bricks sticking out and it dips back a little bit and bricks sticking out. So so you've got, um, it's, it's sort of like you can imagine it's bricks out and then there's a bricks in, bricks out. Does that make sense? And where the bricks come in, there's space there for signage because they've put full, full height brick walls in for sound insulation purposes. Does that make sense? Because they're on a busy road. But what do you get on a busy road? Lots of traffic. Lots of people looking. Correct? So they've designed it in a special way so that they can actually put signage on each of these that's a little bit back from the footpath so they don't get in trouble from the council. So I just, I really want you to start thinking about how many different ways is there to make money off the same asset. All right, we're not finished yet. Um, advertise. Um, 54. Um, who's heard of abatement credits? Who knows what an abatement credit is? Oh, two people, okay. Um, these are your greenhouse, greenhouse or abatement, abatement credits. Because you, you probably don't realise this, but on each of your homes, as an example, um, my, my, this happened to my parents. Someone came knocking on the door and said, hi, we're here to replace your fluoro tubes, uh, your light bulbs for free. We're also here to change your shower nozzle for free. What do you think my parents said? Sure, come on in. And I, they told me about it. I said, can I see the contract, please? And like, they wanted to tell me about the free light bulbs. They were excited getting free light bulbs and a free shower head. I said, yeah, that's all nice, but can I see the contract? Because what they do is they do an audit of your house 
based on the audit, they, they work out how many light bulbs they've changed, how much water your general usage, etc., is, and they work out how much greenhouse credits they've saved you. Based on that, and you've signed over your abatement credits to that company now, right? They consolidate all those abatement credits and they get a, like money back from the government because of, of reducing the greenhouse gas emission. Does that make sense? So many people don't even know the assets they've already got. This is why I want you to start thinking, how many other turns are there off the same asset? All right. Covered billboards. Oh, okay. Um, 55. Writing covered calls. Now, some of you actually from the share market understand what writing a covered call is but you've never thought about doing it with property. And later on, I'm actually going to um, tell you about this, but um, in fact, I'll give you one that many of you, even if you're advanced, may not have heard of this one. Um, how do you make, who's heard the term a renounceable put acceptor? <laughs> really? You just made it up. No, I didn't. I'm going to show you how to make money off being a renounceable put acceptor. You see, there are things out there that you've probably never heard of. And I'll tell you that if you understand that concept, and I'll, I'll give you the reality. Imagine you're a developer. You need to make sure you sell enough so the bank lends you money, correct? But by selling them, you've now locked yourself into a price and you can't make the profit, correct? Imagine if you could still get all the pre-sales, but you still got all the upside of selling them at full market price. How on earth would you do that? Put accept it. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll explain to you. But companies like Macquarie Bank and Babcock and Brown, they do this. As an example, and this is an example you're probably familiar with. Who's heard of when companies float on the share market? What, what they have is they have what's called an underwriting brokerage firm or merchant bank. Who's heard of underwriting? Right? What does underwriting mean from a float perspective? It, like, you're going to do all this work, spend all this money in floating your company, Right? You don't want to get it halfway there. You can't be half pregnant. You're either floated or not floated, correct? So what you want is you want to make sure it happens. And you need an insurance premium to make sure it happens. Does that make sense? So how do you make sure that happens? Real simple. You get someone to underwrite it that says, if we don't sell all of the shares, you're going to buy the remainder to make sure it's floated. Who understands that? So, in many cases, what you're going to find is that there will be um, companies that may have even provided initial funding or arranged the funding for these large-scale developments, and one of the biggest here in Melbourne, Eureka Tower, was actually done via announceable put acceptors to make sure that they got enough pre-sales to build the thing in the first place, right? And I'll explain to you how that happens and how, as a syndicate, you can use them so you can issue them and you can also accept them to make money and or manage risk. Okay? Renounceable put acceptor. 57. Film rights. Do you know that if you've got the right type of properties... You can actually have them, um, what's it called, Sylvania um, Waters? You know, when they had, was that Neighbours there or? No, where does, where does Neighbours get filmed? <laughs> All right, yeah, it's actually in Victoria, but there was another Australian soap opera that was based in Sylvania Waters. Oh, that was a, that was a real life one, wasn't it? Yeah. Right? And they still get tourism and people like that coming through there. But do you know there's a village, um, I was reading, there's a village in London, um, it's got very strong building covenants. Everything needs to be built in a certain style so that they film all the period dramas there. So it looks like you're stepping back into the 18th century or the 17th century. It's a bit like San Francisco, very strong building covenants. San Francisco is used as a backdrop for a lot of films in the US. All right? So... Could you make money out of filming rights? And they pay lots and lots of money when they do films. Okay? Um, all right. 58. Um, a large animal pet cemetery. 
Hey, listen, I, I, I was actually listening with intent. This um, one guy had a big block of land, like lots and lots of land. It was farmland, and he wasn't getting enough returns off, off it, and his horse died. So what's he going to do? Well, he's going to bury it. He thought, I wonder where other people bury their, their loved animals, like, you know, even if they're unloved, but they've got to bury them somewhere, <laughs> Right? Now, you could do smaller pet cemeteries in other areas, but often cemeteries may not always have exactly the same legal things that have to happen with, with humans, right? So you might have a property. Think about this. Large pet cemeteries are still going to have green, green trees and grass, yes or no? So you can still get... So whatever you put underground doesn't really matter, right? But you still get all the greenhouse and abatement credits, correct? Well, I want you to think about multiple turns off the same asset. And by the way, is, a, is land that's available for a pet cemetery more valuable than land that's not really doing anything? Yes or no? <laughs> I don't know if it's carbon neutral. All right. Um, all right. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put one more up there. Oh, okay. Um, 59. Storage area. And 60 as a um, auction area. I'll give you a quick example of these two. Um, temporary car parks. Could you sell an area to be a temporary car park, like where markets are or things like that? Yes or no? All right. Um, so a building site could be a temporary storage and or parking area. Um, a friend of mine who does land works and does auctions of land work equipment... He actually has building sites and he gets other builders and stuff to just dump all their sites on, their stuff on there for storage area. Then he runs the auctions out of there as well. Okay? Um, and last but not least, uh, 61. I'm going to put this one up for a different reason. Air rights. You may have heard of Sunland on Caval, was it Caval Arcade or Caval Mall? Caval Mall, isn't it? On the Gold Coast. Caval Avenue. All right. Caval Avenue. Um, the Sunland Group, because a mate of mine is one of the sales managers there, they bought the air rights on a lot of the buildings around Cavill Avenue. Why? So they can actually build up and extend. Right? So there are people that just buy air rights. Now, sometimes it's to build lots more stories. Other times it's to build maybe a penthouse on top of the building that you can't see from the street because there may be certain covenants that restrict that. Right? So street um, sight lines. So as an example... Oh, actually, I'll just quickly show you. As an example, this is what they may get you to do. And I've known this happen in a couple of situations. You might have um, a building, and here's the street. Here's a person looking up at the up that way. But what they do is they do a setback from the street line, so you can't see it. So that actually um, councils actually. Often they won't approve something that is, it's citable from street level, but something like that isn't because it's, it's got a setback. Does that make sense? All right. So I'm sure as we go through this weekend or this week that we will come up with some more ideas. But have I shown you, put your hand up, have I shown you a couple of new, who, who have I shown maybe 10 more ideas or 20 more ideas or 30 or 40? Can you see that there are so many different ways to make money off property? What I want to do is maybe give your psychology a whole different perspective. It's like, never thought of that. Or now that I've thought of that, what else is it going to trigger in your mind in a brainstorming session tonight that um, when you're trying to sleep, you think, oh, Eureka, what about this? Because this is what happens to me. I suddenly wake up in the middle of the night and I go, pet cemetery. <laughs> and I write it down. Oh, God, yeah, that's a good one. I'll explain to you what adjustment is if you don't know. 62. Adjustment is actually a great business. Adjustment. Because I was thinking of doing this with someone. Um, what adjustment is, is that um, horses need to be spelled, right? So they send them out the countryside and they send them to an area where they can just feed on really good quality grass, etc. But you don't have to provide lots and lots of extra services, right? And the only downside with adjustment is that there's liability because some of these horses are really expensive and you've got to make sure your fences are strong enough to keep the boy girls away from the, from the boy horses from the girl horses. Because sometimes if it's the right time of the season and they smell the, the, the pheromones and the hormones, they just go through whatever to get to the girls, right? So they could be literally um, 
impregnated with a sire which isn't an optimal thoroughbred that wins Melbourne Cups, if you know what I mean, right? And there, there could be like hundreds of thousand dollars worth of damages, right, because of that. So, yeah, adjustment is, a, is another concept that you can actually do, run a business around area and just set it up to be an adjustment um, farm. All right, actually, I'll put another one because you just reminded me now, um, 63, because this is what they do sometimes up here in Brisbane, uh, Queensland, turf farm. All right, that'll do for the moment. Yeah, cattle grazing. Yep, all right. Um, yeah, it's, it's a, adjustment's actually a more specialised form of grazing, right, because you're doing some additional services only for horses and, you know, it's, it's really, you've got to keep the boy horses separate. Like with cows, you don't really mind as much. Sorry? Oh, can you? All right, okay. Well, the, the person who was in thoroughbreds ex was explaining just to me. They said, no, no, we're, we're more specialised with horses. I think it may have been more of an ego thing. There. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The sport of kings, sometimes they have a bit of an ego. Okay. Um, all right. As we go through the five days, I'm sure some of you will come up to me. If you've got any more ideas, come up to me because I'd love to extend that list. I would love it to get to 100. I would absolutely love it. Sorry? Sorry? Yes, Yeah, okay. Um, I answer it. All right, so gas rights. Yeah, there's underground. Um, I'll, actually, I'll give you another one. That. Um, all right, um, 65, tourism. I'll give you an example, a specific example. This guy bought um, a, a cattle stud or a sheep, st a sheep stud. I'm not sure, but his whole purpose was for grazing. And he knew that there was all these boulders and things that um, on the property. So only about 80% of the property was actually usable. But he didn't mind because he got it for a fair price. But what he didn't realise was on his station was that these boulders and rocks, he actually one day, because the previous owners had never bothered, they were just like, oh, it's useless, you know, we can't graze there. But he actually decided, oh, I'll go and have a look around and have a look at the views. He realised that they were one of the most ancient places in Australia for Aboriginal art paintings, cave paintings. And so he's now created a whole tourism around that industry. So he's got bed and breakfasts on site, right? He's created tours to this and done a whole lot of farm-based type of things you can do to get a, a farm experience. So he's actually added tourism as another way of generating income to his, um, to his farm. Does that make sense? All right. So... Hopefully now you've got some perspective on all the different things and all the different ways of doing things, all right? Did you, did you like that exercise, yes or no? Yes. All right. Now, if you um, look through your main books, there's a pink page which has a detailed disclaimer, an important notice you need to read that. Can I just go to the slideshow, please? Okay, I'm just going to read this to you. While every care has been taken to ensure the accuracy of the material presented, and Pound International's employees, presenters, or any of its representatives will not bear any responsibility or liability action taken by any person on the basis of the information contained in this briefing. The content is for informational purposes only. Okay, so I'm here to teach you some great things, and it's up to you to use them, but it's more importantly up to you to get your own advice. I'm not here to give advice. Please don't ask me questions framed like this. I'm in this position. I've just done this. What do you think I should do? Because guess what I'm going to say to you? Go speak to your accountant or go speak to your financial planner or go speak to your solicitor. But if you ask me questions based on that concept, is this possible? Or what does that concept mean and could someone do this with it? Happy to answer that. In fact, during these five days, at the end of each module we get to, I'm going to stop and get any questions answered. Does that make sense? All right? So it'll be much more interactive. But what I also want is in every break that you go out there and um, you teach this and discuss the concepts with the people around you. Okay? Have I got everyone's commitment that they're willing to do that? Yeah. Yes? Great. All right. Now, if you keep flicking through... You'll get to the main page. Um, who here has not heard me speak before? One, two, three, four. Okay, I'm not going to bore the rest of you. There's a whole lot of info there. You can just read it in terms of my background. Okay. Um, you've all been to my two-day event and you would have heard my story then, so there's no point going through that. 
As we go through this, I want this to be much more interactive than the two-day because you can imagine we only have two days at the two-day event and there's more people and there's a lot of content to cover. During these two days, I want to answer a lot more questions. However, I need to do it in this format. What I want you to do is at the end of my section where you've got the green pages, just before the green pages, I want you to pick the, the page just beforehand and write down action list for my syndicate and I. So action list for my syndicate and I. So the blank page just before the green feedback pages, and they'll be my feedbacks and feedbacks for the entire program. Okay? So when will you fill those out? At the end of the five days. Does that make sense? That's my feedback for me and the, the entire program. For each speaker, we'll have separate feedbacks just for their sections, and I will ask you to fill those out just for those speakers, just for their sections. Does that make sense? And there'll be a more shortened um, version of feedbacks. Now, on, on that page where I've asked you to write down the action items for me and my syndicate, the page before that, I want you to turn to a page before that and write down questions. So as we go through, if there is something that comes up that you're not sure of, do not yell it out, do not put up your hand, just write down in the question section because chances are I will probably cover it as I go through. If I don't, then I want you to ask the question at the end of the module. Does that make sense? Does everyone agree to that to minimise interruptions to everyone else? Is everyone all right with that? Okay. Now, because the modules, you can't completely separate different parts of knowledge you will find that sometimes that some of the modules overlap or come from things from a different perspective, right? So I may actually even say to you a question that you may think is relevant here, it's going to be more relevant as we go through the module. So I might say that um, I might come to that question, um, Kurt, in the next module. So I'll just ask you to wait till that module. If I haven't answered it properly in that module, I'll ask you to then re-ask me. Is everyone okay with that? All right? Now... As I said, this is workshop style. This is totally going to... For you to get the most results out of this, you need to play full out. Is everyone committed to playing full out over these five days? Let me hear you. Yes. Fantastic. Most importantly, that's the way you become an active learner and it's all about having fun. Okay, now, let me give you an overview of, of how we're actually going to do these, um, the modules. Module one is all about advanced property research system. There's going to be a part of that, um, for those of you who haven't done this or need a refresher, to get quantified about what your goals are and those sorts of things. I'm not going to cover most of that. I'm going to cover what's relevant. So remember, there are things that you will actually remember vaguely from the two-day event as an idea. This event is to how do you drill down into them, how do you fully understand them, the how-to, and then how do you use them in the context of getting a maximised result for a syndicate purpose? Because now you're operating at a different level. Everything I show you, you need to think, how do I use this for my syndicate to get an outstanding result? Is everyone okay with that? At the first level, all we talked about was, how do I make money out of this? And that's a great question. But this level is, how do I make money through my syndicate through this? Because there's a whole lot of leverage and economies of scale. Right, so that's in terms of research, how to do some more extreme research. Then we're going to talk about an acquisition system. How do we actually acquire those properties and how do we cover some, some additional ideas? The negotiation, what do we do in terms of negotiating a better price? How do we understand what the other person wants and how do we give them what they want first? Advanced valuation system, I'm going to talk to you about some additional things about valuation, how you can use that to get an optimised result. Um, the renovation module, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail from how do you put a, a nail through a wall or how do you um, strip a wall of 60-year-old paint or whatever. I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to talk to you about is from the finance perspective of renovations. Basically, I'm going to tell you something up front. I actually don't like renos. The reason I don't like renos is because people get emotional and passionate about it and they don't look at it as a business or a system. And their knowledge and time could be better spent doing something else. Does that make sense? Okay? It's better to get other professionals in, get them to do it, fine, do it once or twice, understand the process, and what can go wrong, but then get other professionals in. So I'm going to talk about that from that perspective. 
Um, advanced property finance system. I'm going to show you some more things around finance. In fact, I've got a great speaker who's going to come in who's a broker who'll also talk to you about portfolio lending. who will talk to you about some development finance and those sorts of things. We'll take you to the next level of understanding because the more you understand about each of these areas, such as um, the property, the valuations, the development, um, the more you understand about um, the financing, the more you get and the more language you become familiar with, the more you can negotiate and be seen as a professional in that industry. Does everybody follow that? Yeah. All right. Um, then we're going to talk about, this is, and this is really unique, we're going to talk about renounceable contracts. How do you use a renounceable contract? Let's say you're a, a syndicate. How do you use this to get to you to what I call pre-sales, so you can get the money to get started to build the thing within a reasonable time so you still maintain profitability, right? And then how could you possibly resell ones that have already been sold? Wouldn't that be pretty special? And still get the upside. And in fact, what if you could even do this? What if you could lock in at multiple levels different buyers? As the market rises, you just keep reselling the same property legally. How do you do that? because there are people doing that and getting extraordinary results. Or alternatively, how do you as a syndicate be an acceptor to help a developer get pre-sales really fast? I'm going to teach you all of those sorts of things. Things that you can't do individually, unless you may be James Packer, but as a syndicate, you certainly can. Okay, I'm going to talk to you about some advanced rental systems and ways you can actually maximise that, but this one's one of my absolute favourites, equity lease. How do you change the mindset of a renter to be that of an owner-occupier? How do you get them to want to sign up for maybe up to 25 years? How do you drag a negatively geared property and make it positively geared? How do you blow the bank's borrowing calculations out the water and let them and virtually allow them to lend you unlimited funds? Because how many more properties could you buy with that? Okay, so that's actually one of my supreme favourites, equity leases. Then I'm also going to talk to you about my other major favourite, which is property trading. How do you, what's the level of knowledge and skill that you have to have to secure properties and flip them, trade them to make profit gains of, you know, minimum of like 30k, but probably closer towards 50k, maybe even 100k per flip in a trade. Think about this. How many flips and trades would you need to do in a year to replace your income? If, a, if an average flip was 30 to 50K, how many flips and trades would you need to do in a year? One or two. One or two. And literally, do you know what you do for the rest of the year? You play golf. <laughs> you do whatever you choose to. Maybe it's raising kids, spending quality time with your partner, whether it's travelling. Um, two of my mates who are developers um, who are up in Queensland... I, I taught them these sorts of things, and one of them was the funniest guy. He was about to work for Macquarie Bank because he was a share. He was an expert on shares. Studied through the Securities Institute. He did his bachelor in economics, and he was actually offered a job at Macquarie Bank. But I taught him all these things about um, property, and he just couldn't believe it. And he was so negative to property. But every and, and this is the highest compliment he gave to me because he's a super switched on guy. His mother is the. Um, or was the Telstra Businesswoman of the Year for the ACT, and he just kept firing questions at me all day and into dinner and the next day, just non-stop. And I was able to answer all of them. And he then realised that maybe there was some more opportunities in property for someone of his analytical skills. Does that make sense? And he got on to do property flips and trades, made between 30 and 50K a property flip and a trade. And his business partner, I also taught... And they decide to go up to Queensland and become property developers. And most of the time, they play golf. Why? Because of the time frames involved. They've secured properties, but to get the, um, the permits through are just taking them a long period of time. So they sit around and wait. But instead of sitting around and waiting to keep their momentum up, to keep their psychology up, they're actually now looking for more and more deals. If many of those deals, they're not going to take on the risk. They'll value add to it and on sell it to someone else. Does that make sense? Okay. So... Um, that is one of my favourite, absolute favourites, is property trading. Is Let's just go to Module 1, Advanced Property Research System. Now, I'm going to skip through most of Section 1, except this is what I'm going to get you to do right now for me.
One of my mentors taught me something that massively allows me to quantify things. So the concept he uses is the highest and best use of your time. And that's what I want you to keep thinking as we go through this. What is the highest and best use of your time? Can I go to flip charts, please? And the way he measures the highest and best use of your time is a method called dollar cost productivity. Now, you may know who my, one of my mentors is. He's a guy called Dr. Fred Gross. Has anyone ever heard of Dr. Fred Gross? Yeah, one or two people. All right. Um, anyway, this is pretty much what you need to do in life, and I want you to just do this for yourself right now. I want you to write down how many hours a week you work. Right? Write down, is it 40, is it 50, whatever. Whatever it is, just write it down. Including all the overtime, the unpaid overtime you spend at work. Just write it all down. Now what I'd like you to do is, uh, that's at work. Now, I want you to put down at home when you're thinking about work. Does anyone ever think about work at home? Yes or no? All right. So I want you to just write down how much per night is it? Is it an hour? Is it two hours? Is it three hours? Do you know a lot of companies give their employees notebooks they can take home and do what with it? Work. So is it three or four hours a night? And then work it out for yourself for a week. Is it 10? Is it 20? Is it 30 hours a week extra that you work at home? Just write it down. So let's say this is 40, this is 20, and then time spent travelling to work. How many hours a week is it? Maybe it's 10 hours. So I've got 70, actually, wouldn't be, be close to 50. So I'm going to put um, 50, 70, 80 hours per week is what I might, as an example, spend working. Does that make sense? All right. Then what I'd like you to do is think about this. Multiply that by f how many weeks in a year? 52. Does everyone... Who put, put your hand up if you always take your full four weeks per annum leave? All right, few people, not everyone. Could I suggest that many people, particularly if they're self-employed, might take two weeks? Other people, even if they're away on holidays, has anyone ever noticed when people sometimes go on holidays that they take their notebooks with them? Does anyone, ever know, anyone know people like that close to them? All right? So let's just say that you work 50 hours, uh, 50 weeks of the year. So by, by 50 weeks, that's how much? It's 4,000 hours. Would that be correct? So it's 4,000 hours. I want you to work out for yourself how many hours in the week that you work, and then I want you to work out how many weeks of the year that you work, and just multiply it out. Come up with a number. If you're not sure, ask the person next to you to help them with some numbers. So let's say, for instance, I'm at 4,000 hours per week. Oh, per annum. Sorry, yeah, per annum. Per annum. <laughs> yeah, 4,000 a week would be pretty tough, wouldn't it? All right. Um, 4,000. Now, let's say, for instance, you earned $80,000 per annum. Now, if I divided 4,000 4, into 80,000, what would I get? I would get an hourly rate of $20 per hour. I want you to work out what your dollar cost... No, no. I want you to work out what your dollar cost productivity is in terms of hours. Dollar cost per hour. What do you really earn on an hourly basis? Just do this exercise for me. Don't say anything yet. Just do it. If you have any problems, turn the person next to you. Help them. If you, if you don't have a calculator, use the, usually most phones have a calculator. I know you've got them off. You need to switch them off or keep them in silent mode. Or use numbers that are pretty simple. So if I earn $80,000 a year and I work 4,000 hours, that's $20 an hour. Just write it down. Has everyone worked out their hourly rate yet? Okay, yell them out. What are you earning hourly wise? 19? 28? 
34? Zero. Zero. I'm sure we can improve on that. <laughs> what else have we got? 37, 28? 25? 40, oh, well done. 46? 41, terrific. All right, here's my question to you. Are you worth more than 19 to $47 an hour? Yes or no? Yes. Are you? Yes. Knowing what you know and what you do, are you worth more than the 30 or 40 bucks a week that's 30 or $40 an hour someone's willing to pay you? Because what I want you to understand is this, the highest and best use of your time that you will ever, ever, ever have is this. Being a negotiator. That is the highest and best use of your time. Let me illustrate this for you. If you went in to a developer right, and said, I'm willing to buy this property, I want a $1,000 discount. Do you think getting a $1,000 discount would be pretty easy if you're buying, a, let's say, a $400,000 property, yes or no? Yeah. Right? Do you think you'd need a lot of skill, a lot of preparation to get $1,000 off, yes or no? How fast could you ask that question? 10 seconds. Let's say it took you a whole minute because they got to get a response, $1,000, right? Have you just earned $1,000 in that one minute? What's your hourly rate then? Yeah, it's about um, $60,000 an hour, if you think about it, correct? <laughs> hang on, hang on, wait, 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 hang on, hang on. So could you do this? Could you negotiate maybe ten or twenty or thirty thousand dollars discount? That's not going to take a minute, though, is it? How long is it going to take to negotiate on a three hundred thousand dollar property a ten percent discount? Well, it might take an hour because you may need to do a lot of comparable sales. You may need to actually maybe um, you know get your finances sorted so you can buy two of them. But if you're buying bulk, you might be able to get like twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollar discount just even by yourself. And there's, do you, who remembers from my two-day event why developers will sometimes give you discounts? Does anyone remember that? There was things such as sales that have fallen over, there was um, getting to pre-sales, there are clean-up sales, there is getting in before the next um, stage price release. Do you remember all of those reasons I gave? Who remembers all of them? Who here can't remember everything I said at the two-day event? All right, okay. I'll go through some of them as we get more into them, right? No problem. But as a negotiator, you could maybe, for an hour's worth of work, get ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars or even more knocked off a price. Let me ask you, is that a higher and better use of your time on a dollar cost productivity basis? Yes or no? Yes. All right. This is what you need to understand is that the people that are doing this on a day-to-day -day basis, their biology is no different to your biology. But there is one difference. It's not their biology, it's their what? Psychology. They know some more stuff and they use it in the right direction. That's the only difference. Biology is identical, the psychology is different. They're not born any better or smarter. They just know some different stuff. And by the way, let me tell you, some of the people I know in property aren't the brightest sparks on the planet. They're definitely not Einstein material. They wouldn't get a premium at the gene bank, let me tell you. <laughs> but they know some different stuff and they're willing to use it. And that's what these five days is about for you, is learning some more stuff and be willing to use it. Because being a negotiator, particularly in the property industry, opens up so many opportunities. And one of the other big lessons I learned in life is someone said to me, if you want to make some serious money, you've got to play in a game with lots of zeros. If you want to make some serious money, play in a game with lots of zeros. Now, what does that mean? Well, I used to be partners with a guy in a um, hardware and software distribution business and we made margins of 
We just thought we'll undercut everyone else. That was fine. We had huge amounts of volume going through, right, to some big brand names. But let me tell you, the dollar amounts were just not there. It was completely unsustainable for our time. Does that make sense? So one of the things I realised was property has lots of zeros in it. Making a small percentage margin on property means real dollars that you can live off, that you can enjoy a quality of life. In the share market, as an example, if you do things in shares and you sell a share for $5, you bought for $4.50, the percentage is big, but the dollar amount that it's based off is small, unless you do massive volume, right? Now, whatever you believe about share market and property markets is up to you, but one of the things I know about property is I know that there are so many ways to limit the risk in property, but more importantly, I know this, is that I know that 70% of the market are owner-occupiers, People that need to live in property, as human beings under Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we need to live somewhere. And knowing that and putting that as part of my overall system gives me the reassurance that I need. Does everyone follow that? Section one is really about just your psychology. If you haven't done this, uh, can I go back to slideshow, please? Now, I've covered all this at the two days, so I'm not going to go into it. Um, but if you haven't done it, you need a refresh, it's all in there. Remembers the ten-year plan. Who remembers that? Good. All right. Okay. And the circle of wealth. You should remember as well. Stephen's circle of wealth. All right. And the circle of wealth. You should remember as well.